reading a particular gospel, Luke is where we're going to be. Uh, each week, you can follow along on the, the website as well, give you uh, an update of a uh, little preview of what's the next topic we're going to be looking at too, just so you know. Let's pray and, and just jump in here. Father, be with us this morning as we meet, as we gather, as we open your word now. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to whatever it is you want to say to us through the leading of your Holy Spirit so that we would receive it, be changed and renewed by it, and leave from here ready to serve you and to live for you in the world around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and all God's people said, amen. So I don't know how you could not be excited about getting your shrove on through the announcements the last couple of weeks here that Vince has been given to us. So uh, th this season, the spring season leading up to Easter, as well as the fall season, are two of my favorites. Now, we're not going to spend some time in the spring feast like we have in the last few years. We do the fall feast. Always we do the spring feast sometimes. But I just want to review for you a little bit of what this season is as it begins with this Shrove Tuesday. Most people would think of it in terms of Ash Wednesday beginning, but it really picks up on Tuesday. And so I just want to talk about real briefly here as an introduction to this season of life of, of Lent in the season of the church and what it means. Because for me, Lent is a journey with Jesus to the cross. We get so caught up and lost in some of the things that the world makes, either the feasts or holidays, about that we lose the original meaning of it, that we lose the purity of it. Uh, Shrove Tuesday, Bad Tuesday, Mardi Gras. Mardi, Mardi Gras is just Christians gone wild. That, that's all that it is. We, we forget so much about the purity of our faith, about the origins of it, about what it is, and we just want the party. And in, in that, Vince's challenge from the seminar that some of you went to last week with him is, is very important. Are we any different than the world around us? Or do we just look like Mardi Gras? Which again, is, is, it is. It's Christians gone wild. But it really is, it's Shrove Tuesday. What's Shrove Tuesday? Again, so sh just picking up where Vince was and then leading us through a couple of things on the Lenten season. Shrove Tuesday, shrive, means to absolve. It means to set free. It's a time of self-examination. If you, I don't know if he's now, now mixed up. It was today or last, I think last week he talked a little bit about that. The part of the, the idea was, I'm going to begin a period of fasting on Wednesday. So what do I do to get ready for the fast? I get rid of everything in my house that's going to cause me to be tempted to want to eat it. And so I, I consume it all up on Tuesday and get rid of it then. And then I'm ready for Wednesday. At my house, I mean, I've told Sarah many times, like, stop, don't buy like ice cream or buy anything. Because if it's in the house, I can't not eat it. So if, if it, my goal was to give up ice cream on, say, Wednesday, I've, I've got, well, I went out and bought it last night. So I bought... <laughs> I mean, it's hard. Friendly's had a, some deal, buy one, get one free. How could you not, you know? So if my goal for Lent was to give up eating ice cream, let's say, well, I have one, I have one of two options on Tuesday night. Throw it away, come on, or eat it all. And so that's the idea of Shrove Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. It's, it is a spiritual purpose, though. I want to get rid of this in my life because I'm going to spend the next 40 days in a time of, of, of preparing for Easter. So that sets up then Tuesday, that sets up Ash Wednesday, which is that first day of, of Lent. And remembering that we are walking in the footsteps of Jesus, remembering that we are like he had this 40 days of being tempted in the wilderness where he didn't eat and he went without. And it's a time of preparation. It's a time marked by fasting and giving things up so that I'm giving up or even adding, as Vince mentioned, adding things so that I might live more fully in the presence of God and for Jesus Christ. Now this year, we're going to add at our church, which we've not done in, uh, in a while here, is Monday, Thursday service. And that leads us up to that Easter week. And what we've done the last few years is just a Good Friday service. And on Good Friday, if you've come, we've actually blended Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday together. Monday, Thursday, Monday is a word that means mandate or command. And it's from John chapter 13 with the disciples where Jesus said, this is my command, that you would love one another as I have loved you. Does anybody remember John 13? How Jesus showed them the full extent of his love. He did, but he did something very specific in that chapter. He, he, he washed their feet. He took the role of a servant and of a slave, and he humbled himself and he washed their feet. 
Now, don't not come to Monday, Thursday, because you're like, oh, there's a foot washing service. There is a foot washing service that we do, but if you've been here in the past, it's, it's a selected group of people as a visual that, that we see. So if you're showing up Monday, Thursday, and you don't know that your feet are getting washed that night, rest assured your feet are not getting washed that night. If you know you're coming and your feet are getting washed that night, for, for the love of God, wash your feet that day. <laughs> please, you know, please, for Vince and I's sake. So Monday, Thursday is remembering Jesus having that moment with his disciples where he took the role of a servant and he washed their feet. And he taught them to love as he had loved. And then they had communion and we'll do that too. Except we'll do communion first and then wash feet second. It just feels right to do it that way. Um, And then we'll come back, which is so super exciting, Monday, Thursday, Thursday night, 7 o'clock, and then we'll come back for Good Friday service that Friday before Easter. And remember, and to, to to celebrate because we know the end of the story, Jesus' death. And that's what Good Friday is. And then, most exciting of it all, we end the season of Lent, coming together on Easter Sunday, where we remember, we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven that we are loved by God and we are called to walk in the newness of life and to be a representative and ambassador of Jesus Christ. That is the journey that we're beginning right now. And that's why this is such a special time, an important time in the life of believers and the life of the church. Lent, then, just as a couple things on this, is marked by, Vince said it earlier, by things we give up and things we add to our lives. So when you think about Lent, and if you're going to participate in a season of Lent, what will you give up? And what will you add to your life? Now, again, keep in mind, these are spiritual disciplines for spiritual purposes. So often when I hear what we give up for Lent, it's like, well, I'm giving up ice cream. Why? Well, I could shed a few pounds. Okay, could you imagine Jesus and the disciples gathering? You know, how, how's Lent been for you? Are preparing for the, the death and resurrection of me, the Savior? Pretty good. I lost 10 pounds. Don't I look a lot better in my robe? Like, that's Mardi Gras. Christians gone wild. We totally forget It's about spiritual purposes. If if you shed 10 pounds at the end of the season of Lent, great. God bless you. That's wonderful. But in the end, Jesus cares more about our character than rock hard thighs. That's actually from a song, a Christian singer years ago. Don't forget that a season of Lent is about spiritual disciplines for spiritual purposes. And so sometimes I need to take something away from my life, and sometimes I need to think about adding a discipline, like prayer, time alone with God, space. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, he said, as a Christian, hold on to Luke 12, we're, we're, we're almost there. He said, as a Christian to the church, all things are lawful for me. As a Christian, I'm free in Christ. But not all things are helpful for me. You could sit here and debate, should a Christian do this and don't do that? I grew up in a real good church that told us everything about what a Christian should not do. Can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. He's like, As a Christian, all things are lawful for you, but not everything is helpful for you. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated or enslaved by anything. The question to me of Lent is, is there something within my life that I am enslaved to? that I need to give up. And add, when every time I give that thing up and I have a craving for ice cream or M&Ms or whatever it is, I'm reminded I'm going to pray during that time. And I'm going to ask God's help and I'm going to ask God's leading during that time because the greatest goal or the greatest end result purpose of a season of Lent is this. That I could say on Shrove Tuesday, I'm struggling in this area of life. I kind of feel enslaved to this thing. And come back here and sit here on Resurrection Sunday morning and to be able to say like we just sung, I am no longer a slave to whatever it is. Fill in the blank. But I am a child of God. You can spend the next 40 days losing weight and trying to look your best. Or you could spend the next 40 days trying to live for Jesus Christ in all things. And on that day, on Resurrection Sunday, how awesome would that be to say, I am no longer a slave to whatever it is, but I am a child of God. It all becomes a question of our priorities, 
becomes a question of things that we care about, which leads us, what Lent does, is to set a pace and to help us to give our attention to those things. And it becomes a question of where is my heart? Where is my treasure? The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 34, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's, let's read Luke chapter 12 together. Starting there at verse 22, I'll read. And ending with that verse I just read. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, about what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And of which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed, arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For me, the, the key question today, and we'll end with it too, where's our heart? Where's our heart? And a foundational key is this passage begins with actually two things that become extremely pivotal and foundational for how I answer anything in life. Is number one, do I trust in God? And am I seeking his kingdom first? The first thing in those first eight verses, 22 to 30, he paints this picture of don't run around anxiously worrying about food and clothes and how am I going to get this? Am I going to have this? Am I going to have enough of that? Do I have the right kind? Do I have the right style? Do I? And, and we get so nervous about all the things of the world that I think I need. Psalm chapter 127, verse 1 and 2 in there, it talks about that he gives to his beloved sleep. But many of us are eating the bread of anxious toil. Have any of you lost sleep because you're so riddled with anxiety, worrying about what tomorrow holds? Do we trust God? First, first eight verses. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Philippians chapter 4, 5, and 6. So just... Uh, reference it to you. There's a, there's a line in there that we often reference where it just says, don't be anxious, don't worry, and trust in God. But we forget the first part of that. It's the latter part of verse 5. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious, don't worry. I, I, if I just told you, hey, don't worry, but I don't really have an answer for you, you have something to worry about, right? But if I tell you, God is near, Remember Psalm 46, 1 that we looked at a few weeks ago or a month ago now. God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, I will not fear. God is right beside me. The Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. I don't have anything to be anxious about. So a foundational key in this passage to begin with is, do I trust God that much? Do I believe that tomorrow God will provide for whatever those needs are? And the second part of that, verse 31, seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. Trust God and seek his kingdom. Whether we believe it or not, or whether we really uh, think about it or even pay attention that much, we are being sold a lie in the world in which we live. And we're being told and asked to believe that this whole world and our whole life is about us. It's about living for me and it's about building up my kingdom. But the mindset and this lifestyle of a Christian is I seek first his kingdom and his kingdom first and his kingdom alone. Why am I here is a question I would ask myself. Why am I here? What is my purpose? My purpose is to live for him who made me, who gave this life to me. This life, my stuff, everything I have, it's not mine, right? It's his. 
it's his. And so I trust in God with it, with everything that he's given to me. I trust that God will provide. And I seek today and every day to live for his kingdom first, not my kingdom. I live for his kingdom. And then the challenge of that is, back to verse 32, fear not, fear not, little flock, fear not, congregation, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasures in the heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. You have nothing to fear if your greatest treasures in life actually lie within heaven and not here. Because everything I own here and everything I have here will either break, get old, outdated, or somebody is trying to steal it right now. Somebody's scheming right now. I can see it. I can tell. Some of you like this black shirt. It's a new one I got probably. And you're like, I'm going to take it. That's what happens to our stuff. He says, little flock, congregation, you have nothing to fear if your treasure lies within heaven. Whatever you steal from me, take from me, breaks, damages here, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Because my hope is not here. It's there. And so the challenge is, how do I live in such a way that I'm actually storing up treasure in heaven and living for God generously now with what I have? Generosity, giving to the work of God. This is what the life of a Christian ought to look like. This isn't just for the few. It's not just for the, those that they've got extra money and so they can give to others. Tithing and giving to the work of the church, giving generously to other people, contributing to the needs of others, that is the dominant reality of the life of a believer, realizing I've been blessed in order to bless other people and to be a part of the work that God is doing. And here is where the problems lie. Many of you could feel this coming. I can sense it and see it already. Oh no, here we go. A sermon about giving. But guess what? Most preachers are afraid to talk about giving. I was one of those preachers, but no longer am I a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So, as always, if you want to complain about anything at the end of this message, I welcome it. Vmaltempe at yahoo.com is my email. The beauty is... We're just talking about scripture and something that's very passionate on my heart. And for whatever reason, God put on my wife and I's heart at a very young age and some lessons that we learned and things we did. So I'd like to share those with you and some things that are challenging. I'm going to tell you point blank, none of this is very comfortable because nobody likes to talk about somebody else's money. But I don't mind talking about your money. (laughs) So you okay with it? Then let's go. You gave me permission. So the problem is not three years. The problem's not with giving. It's not with giving. We give to ourselves all the time. It's not with giving. And let's be honest, we give to ourselves more than we can afford. And we never have a problem saying that. On average, we spend more than we could afford on technology, entertainment, cars, and houses. I mean, how many times, let's be honest, you had a conversation and say, hey, I got this new tech device, new car, new whatever. Couldn't really afford it. It was way out of the price range, but boy, I looked good in it. So, you know, God to God be the glory, right? I mean, let's just be honest. We don't have problem giving when it's given to me. And we spend more than we're really able to, and that's okay. The problem then, secondly, interestingly, is not with debt. It's not with going into debt. I have no problem going into debt when it's for me. On average, statistically I've heard, and numbers vary all over the place, we spend a good 10% more than we make. But no worries, I've got a credit card. I've got a few of them, right? It's not, not a problem with going into debt. I've got no problem spending even 10% more than I make. I mean, seriously, what's 10% more of what I made? If I made $10 and I'm going to spend 10, 10% more, how much is that? How much is it? It's a dollar. What's a dollar, right? I'll, so I'll spend 11 on the 10 I made. No big deal. But if I go to church and I happen to hear a church person, pastor, throw out that, hey, we should give God 10%. Are you kidding me? (laughs) We have no problem spending an extra 10% on ourselves when I don't have it. But isn't it funny how much of a problem I have when somebody says, maybe you should think about giving God 10% too. And the problem is not that churches talk about money. It's not. The problem is we don't want to hear it. Save your sermon for somebody else, preacher. We don't want to hear it. 
but I think it's an important message we need to hear. And in fact, I've not done a study on this and I gotta double check this, but I have heard from many different places and times that, I, that, that money has come up that it is the number one thing that Jesus talks about in the Gospels is our money, our treasures, our possessions, and the things that we do with it. It comes up again and again. Why? Because the problem is with spending so much on ourselves that we can't give generously to other people. It is a problem if me, if us as a Christian can't give generously to other people, if we can't contribute to what God's doing around us, that is a problem. I don't want to live that way as a believer because I've been blessed and everything's a blessing and I want to give to other people. Again, statistics are kind of all over the place. I've also heard that 97% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So I don't know if these are accurate, but I've heard somewhere in the range of the average home in the United States gives three to four percent of their income to church or charitable giving which that leaves roughly 97% that I'm spending on things for me, if I'm even giving that much. The problem is with debt. It is with debt. Now, you can have this conversation in a variety of different ways with a variety of different people. Obviously, we all have to have some kind of debt of different things we have to have. This is not biblical necessarily in terms of what I'm about to say on this teaching right here, but I am a huge proponent of living as debt-free as you possibly can because there is a huge problem, a huge problem with debt. I'm telling you right now, if you're a young person in the room, if you're thinking about getting married, if you're close to getting married, if you're engaged, I would not spend a dollar until you make yourselves come and sit down with Sarah and I. Not because we ever struggled with debt and getting out of debt, but because at 21, 22 years old, we developed an envelope system. We would not buy anything if it was not money in that envelope. I don't know why it just hit us. We are so cheap. It just worked. But I'm going to tell you, it is such a relief of a, of a burden that can exist on a marriage when you are so strapped with financial debt. And nobody tells you that when you go to buy the brand new thing that you can't afford to buy. Be very, very, very careful with debt. The problem is with debt because when the party's over and when all the mess is there to be finally cleaned up, somebody's got to pay the bills. And we become enslaved to somebody else that I owe money to, and I don't want to owe anybody else money. We don't realize that we are becoming a slave to our debt, and we are enslaved to the things of this world. Part of why I know this is so offensive is because somebody's like thinking I'm talking about their car, their house, whatever. I'm not, okay? If you can honor God and bless God and drive what you want, live where you want, that's fine. That's not the point. Okay? I I just say, be careful. Be careful what you get into now so that you could look good in it and pay later. Be careful. Be careful. The problem is with breaking greed in our lives. We don't realize how greedy we've become as a society. We live as if this life is all there is. Treasures in heaven, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want it now and I want what I want, and I want it in the color I want, and I want it just the way that I saw the one on TV because that guy looked good, and a lot of people wanted to date him, and that's what I want. That's what commercials tell us, whether we know it or not. Like, buy this dish soap, and everyone will want to date you. I'm like, we are being sold a lie. Get it now. Hoard it for yourselves. Don't let others touch it. Certainly let them see you in it, but don't let them touch it because they'll break it. And all our treasures are here, right here. The problem is breaking greed in our lives. Um, Bless you. You know what this is? Some of you may have heard me do this before or talk about this. I've not done a live demo of it, but I had this great idea. We're going to go through two, well, kind of two of these, and I had two in the first service, and I'll have two in the second service. Because I'm breaking greed in my life and I'm preparing for Ash Wednesday, eating all the M&Ms in the house. You know what this is? Go ahead and speak. This is quick, quick. I can't wait on you guys for the answers the whole time. It, this is a gift of God. It's not a football. I'm not throwing it to you, no. This is a gift of God. This, this is a tool. Do you know what this is? I forgot this. I wanted to do this in the first hour. You know what this is? This is how I call my kids when I don't want them. Right? Right? 
I, I used to be, you know, five, ten years ago when I came home, it was, it was, it was like the king came home, you know. Dad's here, dad's here, everybody flocked to me. Now, I don't even know I have children. They're, I come home, and they're gone. They're all over in the rooms on their tech devices. They don't care at all about me. But the minute I go to the cupboard and do this, you would think I have three kids that have never eaten and that love me for just no particular reason at all, right? So, about ten years ago, my oldest, is, who was in the first service and got to hear this and be reminded of again, about five years old, four or five years old, dad came home with a bag of M&Ms just for my little girl, right? It was not peanut. It was, it was regular. And I gave her a bag of M&Ms, and here was Maria. This is what she did. Thank you, dad. Dad's, I got the best dad in the world. <laughs> I love my dad. Thanks, dad. And as she's going like this, I went, hey, Maria, you think dad could have one of those M&Ms? She went, my precious, my precious, leave me alone, get away. <laughs> Who are you? I'm not kidding you at all. This is not a joke and this is not made up. This is literally what my daughter did. She went like this. That one's way too big. And she went like this. And she handed me an M&M. I'm going to tell you, you do that to me. I just spit an m and you do that to me in my house, you're getting a sermon. All right? My Bible college professor said, you better be ready to preach, pray, and die at any given moment because you don't know when God's going to call you. And God called me to preach that day. So my little girl got something that she was told that day. Not quite as articulate as I'm going to give it to you now, I hope. But I said to her, are you kidding me, baby girl? <laughs> Who bought you those M&Ms? Who bought you these? These are not yours. You didn't earn these. You didn't work for these. You know, and I know how kids will start to talk as they get older. These are mine. I live in this house. You, you live in this house? You pay the bills? You do? No, no, you didn't buy these. I bought these for you. Do you have any idea I could blow your mind when I pull this credit card out and how many, I'm not going to go into debt for them because I just talked about not going into debt, but you know how many M&Ms I could buy you? I could open the storehouse of M&M's. I could call Mr. M&M and bring more M&M's than your little mind could possibly fathom. I could make you so sick with M&M's. And yet when dad says, could you just give dad just one little M&M? You went like this and acted as if you didn't even know me. Folks, this is a picture of our lives. I fear. This is a picture of our lives. These are my M&Ms, and these are mine, and I'm not giving any back to you. Now, this is what we ought to do with our lives. Now, it's rooted in my understanding of the text. It's rooted in my personal practices, and you can, there's some of this, there's gray areas. You could disagree if you want to disagree, and you can live a different way, and that's your own plan. As long as we're honoring God, as long as that's our first priority, that's okay, right? So, what I would do is say, hey, these are, these are not my M&Ms. These are my bag given to me, but these are God's M&Ms. God, thank you for the gift that you've given to me. Thank you for what you have done for me to maybe help me make these M&Ms, to help me to get these M&Ms. Whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever passions you've put on my heart that enabled me to get these M&Ms, thank you because these are yours and you gave them to me first. The Psalms say, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I am yours and these are yours. And so because these are yours, because that's the dominant reality of my life, when I open these up, I don't immediately go crazy on them. I say, God, the first one is yours. And this M&M goes to you because that is the dominant reality of my life. And I believe with all my heart that your word has called me to and that I'm called to be a blessing. And I'm called because I've received blessings to bless others. And so I believe, particularly my opinion, first and foremost, my church gets that part. And I want my church to have that. And there's some other places that I believe in very much so that I want to give to. And so at the beginning of every year, Sarah and I sit down together and we decide out of what we bring in, this, of what God has given to us, this first part goes to God. I don't put a number attached to that. I'm not telling you what that number is attached to. There is not a 10% rule that applies to us today in terms of New Testament believers. Paul says, give what you've decided in your heart. The decision between you and God to sit down, whatever that is. But I believe with all my heart, and my kids have to practice this every dollar they get, no matter how they get it, no matter what. They're made to do this. 
when they're 18, 19 years old and living on their own, in their own house, you live in my, I don't care if you're 40 years old living in my house. You will practice this. Don't care. That sounds oppressive. That's fine. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God gets what's first and for, foremost in our lives, not what is simply left over. And then out of that, obviously we have bills to, play, to pay and things that we have to do and so we take care of and so here's the bills that we have to pay. God, I hope that I'm honoring you and making good decisions financially in the things that you've given to us and the things that we're pursuing, but we need to pay those bills. This is true of my own kid's life, actually for my kids because they don't have any bills yet. They get it in the middle here. But the next part of this is savings, is, is every month something needs to be tucked into savings because guess what? That car that you have, no matter how fancy and nice and new at some point, it's going to break down. It's going to need some things, and I don't want to be shocked by that. So as for me and my house, God, some bills, and savings, that comes first. And then I look at my bag, and I think, oh, happy day. I got one M&M left. Party time. Whatever I want to do, wherever we want to go. Well, guess what? Is In my house, we're saying, boy, but what we want to do this month, it costs two yellow M&Ms, and we've only got one. Guess what, kids? Guess what, Sarah? Next month, we're going to party with two M&Ms because we're going to save and wait till next month because I don't want to go into bury us into debt. I want to be very careful because if you start adding up how many M&Ms I now owe next month, I start cutting into this and cutting into this. And then the first thing that often goes is, well, you know, we'll get to God when we get time. And we don't often have time. And we run out of space. And we run out of money. And at the end, I open my bag and think, oh my goodness, I still owe a bunch. And I have nothing left for God. And I don't think we should live that way as a Christian. And giving to God isn't just giving to church. It's contributing to the needs of others. It's giving generously to other people. It's giving to God what is God's. It's honoring him first. And he gets first. Bills go second. Savings, that's again, this is, that's gray area. You can decide what you want to do in terms of some of those things. That's whatever. You can also decide what you want to do in terms of giving to God. That's your decision. As for me and my house, we choose to honor God. And it's vitally, vitally important. I want to ask you a few hard questions. We'll step it up a notch. I won't belabor on these points. I just want to illustrate that a little bit for us to think about. I don't know that we think about it enough. I don't know that we challenge ourselves enough. I'm at fault for not bringing this before us as a a church, as a body of believers. If all you think it's about money and getting money here, you are wrong and you have no idea who you're talking about. I've been judged so much over my life that I don't really care anymore. It's, it's fine. You can think, I've, people have told me, I've said a, ma- a million different things that I've never said, and I think you have no idea who you're talking to. You don't know my heart, and that's okay. That's okay. But I'll ask you some hard questions. This was a sermon I heard a few weeks ago, absolutely just tore me up thinking about this stuff, and I wanted to share it with you because I loved it so much. I love getting beat around in a sermon sometimes, as I know you do too. <laughs> um, does, here's just some questions. Does what we do with our money look any different than what the world does? Could somebody tell we're a Christian just based on how we spend our money? At some point, how we spend our time and how we spend our money and what we do with our talent, somebody ought to be able to step back and say, there's something different about them. Boy, is there something different about them. I don't know what it is. And as they explore a little more, they find out, wow, makes sense. Makes sense. I know, I know I've, uh, this is, I feel like a new audience every week of different people, but uh, uh, my, my Cracker Barrel waitress story, I, I love that. I'm sitting there with a couple of guys, and the guy's like, man, I just got to ask her. I got to ask her, what are you going to ask her? You need more bread? You need some, some, some jam? What do you need? No, I got to ask her if she's a Christian. Why? There's just something so different about her. I just, I bet she's a Christian. I just want to ask her. I just want to ask her. I just, it's, it, sure enough, she came back over. Hey, I just got to ask you, are you a Christian? She said, yeah, how? Why? I don't, like, I don't have like a what would Jesus do bracelet on her. He said, there's just something so different about you and I knew. And I just wanted to ask. Is there anything different about how we spend our money that the world would say, wow, that's different. And I fear that like the Mardi Gras Christians gone wild, we really just live the same as the world. It's just, we have to go to church sometimes on Sunday. Is our relationship, question number two, is our relationship with his money aligned with his will? When I pray over my M&Ms, 
God, this is your money, and I want, I want to honor you with this. And is it aligned with your will? Am I spending it the way that you want to spend? We, we debate a lot of really silly things when it comes to finances and money and how we spend our money. But if we would just step back before we spend it, do you ever step back before you spend it? And just God. Somebody told me one time, and I, and I love this, it was, like, it was God's will that I got this car. I'm like, all right, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. And if it was God's will, if it was this. And I asked him, I said, did you do this? Did, like, how did you know that one place to go to? Did God lead you? Well, no, I did some research. Mm, you researched. But at least, did you, when you went to the dealer, did you go like this? Uh, hey, welcome into the shop. Let me show. No, nope, no, don't do nothing. Just reach your hand back, grab a set of keys, and the one keys that you get, that shall be thine car that the Lord has owned. You didn't do that. So don't say it's God's will that I bought this car. Say that God give me wisdom and discernment and study so that I can make a wise financial decision with his money and honor him in the best way that I possibly could. That sounds a little smarter. You know, we as Christians just say a lot of dumb things sometimes. Is it aligned with his will? Well, yeah, this is aligned with his will, and it made sense. I could buy it, and I could do other things with it. I need to get back and forth to work, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of ways, and I happen to like this style and this version and this whatever, okay? Now, I, I, got, I got a Jeep Compass out there that's about as close as you could get to say that's, that was like God's will kind of thing. I know I like the Jeep, and I like the compass, the look of the compass. My grandma passed away and left my dad a lot of money. And my dad said, instead of waiting until I die, I want to buy something for you and I want to get you a car. And I said, okay, uh, I don't like getting anything new, but I'll, I'll go with you. And we looked at a car. I went and I said, I like the Jeep, like the compass. Guess what color I wanted? Black. Well, they didn't have black. So I said, well, that one looks cool. Okay. I, I said, oh, maybe I should sit in it. I sat in it, looked at it. Never been in a Jeep compass before in my life. I said, let me look at the trunk because that's what a good car buyer would do. I looked at the trunk. And I shot it. I said, let's go talk numbers. Talk numbers. I said, well, we're paying cash today, so that's okay. And then I said, you know what? I should, maybe I should test drive it just to see if I even like it. So dad and I jumped in, literally went around the parking lot once. I said, okay, we'll take it. I'm driving home, and I said, how do you, how do you roll the windows down in this thing? <laughs> Are you kidding me? What kind of a brand new car two years ago doesn't have power windows or power locks or anything? I'm an idiot. Like, that was the dumbest. Kids get in my car and go, oh, look, it's got power. It's, look at these windows. You know, it, it, it's okay to get stuff that we want. It's okay to get stuff that we like. It's okay to say, I happen to like this kind. Let's just use wisdom and discernment with how we get there, okay? Third question, Nod. Um, does the way we spend our money reflect that God is our highest priority? <coughs> Does it reflect that God is our highest priority? Do, do our checkbooks reveal maybe actually that comfort, pleasure, prestige, and status are our highest priorities? What does our checkbooks reveal? And this, this last one, I added this one uh, just on some reading this last week in a passage in Malachi chapter 3. Read all of Malachi. It's very short. But read all of Malachi if you want to just kind of be challenged in some really tough ways. But in Malachi chapter 3, there's this powerful picture of God talking about what you haven't given to me and test me in this. And the question is, am I robbing God? Because in Malachi 3, it says, you're actually robbing me. You're robbing me by not giving me back to what, what is due me. You're robbing me by not honoring me. He goes, put me to the test. You, you, you put me to the test. Give me one M&M, and I will open up the M&M warehouse for you, and I will pour them out on you. Put me to the test if you don't believe that this is true, he says. And so I want to give us three challenges as we kind of wrap this up to be a good steward of his money. Number one, ask the Holy Spirit to deepen our commitment. What if this Lent season, I spent time praying, God, Holy Spirit, deepen my commitment to the things you want me to be committed to. Deepen my commitment. Deepen my trust with what I do with your money and what you've given to me. Deepen my love. Deepen my trust. Deepen my faith. Deepen my generosity. We sing a song, Hosanna, in here at church sometimes, and there's a line in the bridge that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Number one, ask the Holy Spirit to deepen our commitment. Number two, Get honest and informed about our spending habits. This is a conversation between you and God, between you and your spouse, between you and your home. Get honest and informed about spending habits. Don't deceive ourselves. In this sermon I listened to a few weeks ago, I said, would you be willing to open yourself up to a heavenly audit? Allow God to come in and take a look at the books and talk about where we're spending money and where it's going and why we're spending it and what's happening. Prayerfully look at the numbers. Do, do you even know 
what is percent I give towards income, uh, of my income, towards tithing, towards uh, charitable contributions, toward bills, towards savings, towards extras, towards being generous? What, what, are, what are the percentages of what we do? Or is it just kind of haphazard? Which is why number three is so important, and number three is, is a particular favorite of mine, and number tr- three is a particular problem, I think, for too many, is develop a plan. Develop a plan. Look at the numbers, pray about it, and develop a plan. Too many of us sit down and have no plan, and we're just throwing M&Ms left and right. Oh, I want this. Yeah, I want this. I want that. And when there's no plan at the end of the month, oh my goodness, I need more M&Ms. So I need to borrow. Can I borrow a few M&Ms from you? Can I borrow a few? I just need to get this thing, and I'll get it back to you. Think about it like that. I mean, that's new. I didn't think about that the first hour. But man, I just, I really need this, and I just need, I need a few more. I just, could I get a couple M&Ms from you? And then give me a couple more M&Ms for you guys, and a couple more over here, because I want to, I just need this one thing, and a couple more here. Well, then next month, I'm like, I got all my regular bills, and I got all the other stuff, and man, I owe them M&Ms, and I owe them M&Ms, and I owe them. Well, well, like, there's a lot of family. There's some family over here. I'm not going to give to them. They're fine. Like, they're, they, they love me, so whatever. And, like, this side's over here. Like, here's Paul. Like, he's going to come at me. Like, he's going to get my, I got to pay him first. And now I'm, I'm a slave to fear and anxiety and all these things because I didn't have a plan. Ask the Holy Spirit to deepen my commitment. Get honest and informed about spending habits and develop a plan. Again, Paul said, decide ahead of time with God what you're going to do and excel in the grace of giving. If you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, homework assignment. Take a look at Malachi and take a look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 with this. And maybe ask ourselves as I'm planning, is there any expenses I could cut? Any way I could live on less? increase generosity and take some baby steps in this whole thing. It's not about I got to be like somebody else and do what they do. But I want to take some steps this year to honor God for all that he's done for me. The idea is how am I living for God with everything that he's given to me? In my life, in my finances, with my talents. Again, the question here as we begin, where's our heart? Where is our heart? Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. This all is a picture of our heart, which is shaped by trust in God and seeking his kingdom. And as a Christian, I believe with all my heart, it is vitally important to be generous in giving to the things of God as a matter of first priority. It is so vitally important. I could spend my whole life and not have whatever this like cool thing in my mind I'm really wanting right now. And guess what? It wouldn't make a difference in the end if I had it or I didn't have it. But it means the world if I go through this whole life just pursuing my things, and then if there's anything left over, maybe I'll give it to God. Choose to make God a first priority in our time and our talents and our treasures. Let's give God what is our first and what is our best. And then honor him in the way in which we live and pursue this life with the rest. The beauty of the challenges of scripture, this again, is that they are straight from scripture. And the apostle Paul to a young pastor named Timothy, told the church this, and I want to read his challenge to them so many years ago to us today as we close. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Paul told Timothy, tell your church this, as for the rich in this present age, which I know many of us are saying right now, I'm checked out because I'm not rich. Every one of us in this room is rich. We are, we are so rich beyond belief. If you've never traveled to other places, if you've never been to, to dirt floor huts and villages, if you've never been on a, one of the Honduras or Nicaragua trips and seen how other people in this world live, we are, we, are, we are so stinking filthy rich. I may not have what my neighbor has. I may not have what somebody else thinks, but I am so rich and so blessed. Keep that in mind. As for the rich in this present age, charge them, challenge them. Don't be arrogant. Don't be boastful. Don't be haughty. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. We are called to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life that is truly life. Some people say, and listen, no disrespect, okay? I'm just pointing the way we say it sometimes. 
You know, I finally reached that place, and I, and I got retirement, and I made all this money, and I got a yacht, and I'm out, and I'm in there in that moment saying, this is the life, isn't it? And, and we can pull back and say, hey, this is good. Yes, it is. It's good. But no, this is not the life. No, it's not the life. Hey, check me out in my new car. My top's down low and my hair's blowing in the wind. This is the life, isn't it? Amen. Hey, hey, that's good. It's good. Man, it's good that you've been blessed. But no, this is not the life. Apostle Paul told us the life that is truly life is all about our relationship with Jesus Christ and being rich in good deeds for other people. That is the life that is truly life. And everything else is just cherry on my Sunday. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your blessings to us, our, our M&Ms, whatever they might be. First and foremost, I pray there's not a person in here, myself included, that could walk out of here today and say that we're not rich. We're so blessed. You've given us so many things. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. My prayer is that we would be a church that's different, that we would be Christians that are different, that we would seek to honor you and to bless you and to give back to you and towards others because of all you've done for us. So I pray that you would guide us in these things. I pray that you would renew our commitments to you. I pray that you would guide us as we stand upon your word, stand upon our faith and our rock solid foundation in Jesus Christ, our Savior, trusting that you will provide for all our needs, saying thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us and choosing to honor you and to live for you in all things. Guide us now as we go, as we stand on the promises of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we pray in his name. Amen.